Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another fa fantastic homeless romantic podcast. Some today we have somebody very special who put his life on the line to tell the American public what they needed to know about the torture program, ex-CIA whistleblower, Mr. John Kiriakou. How are you, John? Hey, doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying John has a radio show uh, that has been banned on most every platform. He's currently, he's been deplatformed. Uh, and everybody knows right now that the mainstream media and the, the government is going in overdrive trying to silence anybody who's not for the Ukraine war or for this and that and the other. So it's really important, John's radio show. It's on Sputnik. If you can find it, just search around. But he's going to talk about the topics that nobody else is going to talk about. Um, so welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate it. I want to bla blast through a few questions that I had prepared um, in response to. I tell people shortly. Yeah, you you were a CIA whistleblower. Um, you told people about the you 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 talked to the journalists about there being a torture program. It was fine for a few years. The Obama administration, as things change, Obama came in and actually was more cruel to whistleblowers than he'd ever been than any other president. Yeah, and essentially um, reopened the case. Threw you under the bus and made you serve. How much was it? Twenty two months. Twenty three months. Twenty three months. Yep. And uh, and basically uh, started a new era of cracking down on whistleblowers that um, is yes. still going on today, and we're still it's still getting harder and harder to do things like this. Um, yes. And then later, there's some issues with uh, you interacting with Trump and, and trying to get a pardon from him. And of course, no, to no avail, I'm assuming. Um, and to this day, are you still a felon technically, or do you have a passport? Is it? Can oh you yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I've paid my debt to society. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I've got a passport. I, I travel extensively. Um, I just got back from, uh, from Israel on Tuesday and uh, earlier in the month I was in London and I was in Saudi Arabia in July. So I travel a lot, but, um, what a, what a pardon would do for me is it would give me back my, uh, my pension, my federal pension, mm. which was confiscated. So, uh, you know, I had $770,000 saved in that pension. I'd like to have it back. Yeah. That's really why I'm going for the pardon. But otherwise, you know, as soon as I got out of prison, I applied um, for a state pardon through the office of the governor of Virginia. It was Terry McAuliffe at the time. Mm -hmm. And man, that guy's office could not have been any more helpful, any more kind. Uh, they expedited it. I got this big certificate with a gold seal and the governor's signature on it. They reinstated all my civil rights. So for me, it's all about the pension. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And for everybody out there listening, this is a man who risked his life to tell you guys all that there was malfeasance and uh, maybe you could write your congressman, write your, I don't know who, how politics work anymore, <laughs> but just- oh, I appreciate that. Thank try, you. Try to try to uh, shine the spotlight on this man for what he's done. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with my line of questions. So I, I really, the CIA is a sketchy organization and it's, it's mm -hmm. famous for doing very sketchy things in the dark and stuff. So how did you begin your career and how, what was your, rep, like, what did you think of them at the time? What was known about the CIA? Right. And uh, has it, has your opinion about that changed over time? <laughs> well, dramatically to answer the easy <laughs> question, uh, dramatically. Uh, I, I didn't apply to the CIA. The CIA came to me. Uh, I was in grad school at George Washington University, and I was taking a class called the Psychology of Leadership. Fascinating class being taught by an eminent psychiatrist by the name of Gerald Post. He had a, he had a PhD in political science, a PhD in psychology, and an MD, and he called himself uh, a political psychiatrist. So, um, he assigned us a paper one day uh, where we had to shadow our bosses for a week and write a psychological profile of our bosses. So um, I, uh, I was working at the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union at the time at their headquarters here in Washington. And I, I worked for this guy who was sort of an old school, tough, mean, you know, son of a gun. 
he had had his back broken by scabs during a strike. And it was, he was just one of these old time tough guys. You know, you see pictures of, uh, of these old school union guys with baseball bats and stuff. That was him. <laughs> so halfway through the week, uh, I was actually a little bit afraid of him. And halfway through the week, we had an argument and I called him a racist, which he was. And he got so angry, he balled up his fists. And I put up my hands because I thought, oh, I went too far this time. I put up my hands and he says, my penis is bigger than yours. And I said, what? And he says, my penis is bigger than yours. And I said, you know what? You're nuts. And I quit. And I walked out. I quit. So I wrote my paper. I said that he was a sociopath with psychopathic and possibly violent tendencies. Backed it up you know, with evidence and stuff. And turned in the paper. A week later, I get it back from Dr. Post. And he gave me an A. And he wrote in the margin, please see me after class. So I went to see him and uh, I said, Dr. Post, you wanted to see me. Yeah, close the door, he says. So I, I closed the door and he says, listen, I'm not really a professor here. I'm a CIA officer undercover as a professor here. And I'm looking for people who might fit into the CIA's culture. I think you would fit in. Would you like to join the CIA? Well, the truth was I was getting married like six weeks later. I had no job. I had a master's or just finishing a master's degree in legislative affairs, which wasn't going to do anything for me. And so I said, sure, why not? Always wanted to see the, the world, interested in public service. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was I was in the CIA. Had you ever seen a James Bond movie up until that point? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I loved it. <laughs> I, I, I loved the idea of it. I loved the the subterfuge and you know the excitement. And I, I had done a lot of traveling in college. I had gone to about two dozen countries in college just on my own, you know, with a backpack and my girlfriend and stuff. But but this this sounded exciting. And like I say, you know, I, I come from an immigrant family, and and public service was always something that was very very important in our household. You know, we were very grateful for the opportunities that this country gave us. And so I actually only looked at jobs in, in public service. I was thinking, you know, maybe I'll go into the foreign service. Maybe I'll, you know, go to the Hill. I had this master's degree in essentially in lobbying, you know, and then this opportunity presented itself. Uh -huh. So when was the, eth like, was there an ethical component that eventually struck you where you started saying, Oh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, wait a oh, minute. So Totally. See, my, my career was divided into two halves. The first half was in analysis, the Directorate of Intelligence, where you write, you know, the president's daily brief, you write for the secretaries of state and defense, for the national security advisor, the CIA director. And so you're, you're doing, you're, you're offering up your analysis to support policy. Um, I got bored with that uh, about seven and a half years into my my career. And, um, as it turned out, I was the only person in the CIA at the time that spoke both Greek and Arabic fluently. And so, um, I applied for a position as a counterterrorism officer in Athens, uh, working on Arab terrorist groups. And it, it sounds quaint now, but Euro communism mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got the job. So I went through traditional operational training and, uh, and found that I had a knack for it. So I did two years in Athens. I came back in the summer of 2000 uh, to head a, a group that trained Middle Eastern intelligence services in counterterrorist operations. And then 9-11 hit. And um, I found myself as the chief of counterterrorism operations in Pakistan. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So the Greek was a given, like you, your grandparents were Greek. And yes. You, and when you, you got a present, you, all you wanted was the gyro bladder, the hero. Yeah, bladder. Seriously, <laughs> seriously, man. I love that. Um, <laughs> I, Greek, Greece is beautiful. Greece is really beautiful. spectacular. Oh, my God. In fact, I, I'm jumping way ahead. But when I got in trouble, uh, the Greek ambassador called me and he said, how can we be helpful? And I said, you can give me Greek citizenship. And they did. And wow. not just they gave it to me, they gave it to all five of my kids, too. 
Way to go. Well, Greece is mad at the United States and the EU anyway, so <laughs> they're like, anything we can do, John. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, well, and so, and so, it, but your, your, um, your kind of idea about the CIA, when did it change? When did you think, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I can tell you, me. I can tell you exactly when it changed. Um, I can tell you the, the hour that it changed. Okay. On the night of uh, March 28th, 2002, I led a series of raids that resulted in the capture of Abu Zubaydah, who we believed at the time was the number three in Al Qaeda. Um, those raids also netted many dozens of, I'm not allowed to say the number, but many dozens of Al Qaeda fighters and several Al Qaeda um, mid level leaders. Um, there were a couple of things that happened that night that changed my perspective. One of them was we had captured so many guys that night that we had to bring them to our safe house for interrogation in shifts, right? We could only fit like 10 at a time in the paddy wagon uh, to bring them to the safe house. And um, there were a bunch of guys working for me on loan from headquarters who I really didn't like or respect. There was one in particular who was just furious because he believed he should be in charge. And in fact, he had he had flunked out of operational training. So he he shouldn't be in charge of a coffee clutch, let alone a counterterrorism operation. So he brings the first load of prisoners to the uh, to the safe house and they all have hoods on. Like like sacks on their heads. Mm. And I said, why are they hooded? And he says, we don't want him to see who we are. We don't want him to know our identities. And I said to him, I got right in his face. And I said, are you seriously telling me that you've never read the Geneva Convention? Are you seriously telling me that you don't know it's a fucking war crime to hood people? Yeah. And I said, take those hoods off. And he says, I'm reporting you to headquarters. And I said, no, I'm reporting you to headquarters for committing a war crime. Well, we reported each other to headquarters and headquarters took his side. Oh, shit. Because the Geneva Convention means nothing. Well, we're at war, they said. I said, actually, we're not at war. Mm -hmm. There's been no congressional declaration of war. Right. Yeah. Al Qaeda is not a not a uh, uh, state actor. No, we have to treat them as civilians and you can't hood them. Yeah. So that that was the first inkling to me that the rules had changed. Then I get back to headquarters and I'm back. Let me think. I'm back like three weeks. I've just caught the purported number three of Al Qaeda with these two hands. Right. And I get passed over for promotion. Hmm. So I go to the deputy director of the counterterrorism center, who was an old friend of mine. And I said, what the heck happened? I said, what do I need to do? Catch bin Laden? How do I get promoted around here? And he said that the promotion panel determined that by turning them down, when they asked me if I wanted to go through the torture training, that I had displayed a shocking lack of commitment to counterterrorism. They asked 14 people to be trained in the use of these enhanced interrogation techniques. I was the only one who said no. And so they passed me over for promotion. Well, I ended up getting a much better job. I became the executive assistant to the CIA's deputy director, who was secretly anti-torture, although he never said so out loud. Did you win? So when you got when you did that and you said, hey, uh, they're like, hey, you guys, you should learn this. And you said, I'm not really into that. Did you think at that point that they would be maybe looking at you differently from now on? You didn't think about that. No, I didn't. And and friends of mine from the, the time, from the period, uh, tell me that they completely turned on me back then. And I had no idea. I had no idea. So I, I mentioned to the deputy director, I said, I, I can't believe I got passed over for promotion. And then he gave me what's called a field promotion. He just ordered me promoted. So at least I, and see, that's one of the reasons why I thought I was okay. You know, they used to call me the human rights guy. And a, a friend of mine told me afterwards, you know, that that was not a compliment. <laughs> they weren't complimenting you. Nope. 
<laughs> so yeah, it was 2002 that my view of them changed and their view of me changed. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. That is so incredible. Yeah. The human rights guy, that's not a compliment. No, um, not a compliment. And, then, and then that's what I, that brings me to my next question because the CIA is inherently always involved in dark, shady business and they are always in the business of lying and hiding and doing all this stuff. So at no point, like even in this conversation, John, I don't trust you. <laughs> but but seriously, like when you get involved with an organization like that, you never know who your friends are and, and your allies yeah. are. It seems tricky. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if I could handle that kind of life. But they have done everything from uh, using LSD on unsuspecting citizens, yeah. backing nearly 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 coups in South America and all over the world, which yes. is great reading if anybody out there doesn't know. Um, and as we know now, torturing suspected terrorists or you know, or anybody yeah. that fits that bill. Um, right. So what, in your opinion, are some of the most egregious and, and, and horrible things the CIA or the government has been guilty of through our history? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Where do you even begin? You know, you have to start really with, uh, well, if you're looking at if you're looking at egregious things against human beings, you have to begin with the LSD uh, uh, trials. Um, they dosed people with LSD, not giving them any any warning that they were doing this. You know, we we had a C CIA contractor. There have been TV shows and films made about him. We had a CIA contractor who was dosed with LSD who had no idea what was happening, and he jumped out of a hotel window and, and killed himself. Yeah. Um, there are reports, which I've always assumed are true, uh, that uh, the CIA put LSD in in dough to make bread in a French village in the 1950s that made half the village go completely crazy. Uh, the CIA worked hand in glove with Nazi scientists through the 1950s and the 1960s. The CIA has overthrown countless governments. And in some cases, like Iran, for example, we're still paying the price for that decision. Uh, the CIA has instituted a torture program, uh, an international rendition program, a secret prison program. Uh, they've spied on the United States Senate and its uh, investigators. I mean, you could go on and on. Volumes of books have been written about this kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's not a proud history. Yeah, and right now I'm finding it really difficult to find any information on Kirchner in Argentina and what's going on there because I would try to share videos of this alleged assassination. But what I do know is that any socialist government that comes to power in uh, South America, that it's a big fucking deal for America, and they go down there, and the CIA most likely, I don't know, tries to subvert that democracy or do whatever and in the i'll just interject here and say that in the case of eva morales they kid they got this woman that happened to be in a picture with him and apparently said that that was his underage lover and all this stuff mm -hmm. and then he raped her yeah. well, the police actually kidnapped this woman and held her for multiple days without food and forced her to make this statement saying that the president of bolivia um raped me or whatever mm -hmm. and she escaped made it to somewhere else with her family intact and was able to say, hey, that stuff I just said, I just made it up. The police fucking made me say it. Um, mm -hmm. So this is something to be aware of in America. Anybody from America listening, this is this is crazy. What do you think about that, John? Side note. Well, you know, pre 9-11, I would have, my head would have just bobbed up and down and I would have said, yeah, the CIA does that kind of things. Post 9-11, um, there's a lot less of that. Uh, and it's because the CIA has so many more important things to worry about. Terrorism, Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China. Those are what are called tier zero um, issues, meaning drop everything and focus on this. I remember, I remember hearing a senior officer give advice to a junior officer who spoke Spanish and was interested in making a career in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And the senior officer said, go make a career in Latin America. You'll never get promoted again. And you'll never find yourself in a position of influence at headquarters because nobody gives a shit about Latin America anymore. Wow. And I found that to be true post 9-11. Wow. Why is that? Is there are the resources not important enough or do we have a good enough grip on it or... 
Well, they're just, I mean, resources, believe it or not, are finite, especially human resources. And um, you've got to focus on the stuff that's the most immediate. And, and you know, people don't realize that it's the White House that sets the, the CIA's agenda. Um, if the White House believes that the biggest problems the country faces are Russia and China, then everybody's going to be working on Russia and China. It's not an accident, for example, that that John Brennan created uh, the Iran, uh, it's called the Iran mission uh, at the CIA to coordinate all Iran activities government wide. We already had an Iraq mission. We have a counter, um, uh, what's it called? Counter proliferation center, a counter terrorism center. It's, it's those big tier zero issues that everybody's focused on. And, you know, if you're inside the CIA too, you want to get promoted and you're not going to get promoted working on Paraguay. Yeah. You're going to get promoted working on Iran. Gotcha. Gotcha. Korea. Well, that would, that would tell me that South America is no longer a threat and anything that's it's, we have no. absolute control. You know, Kissinger actually said, uh, and this, I think this is true in the case of things like Maduro because Maduro uh, is socialist and a lot of been populist in the way where they voted for him and they like him. Uh, but the, all of a yeah. sudden there's food shortages. Well, Kissinger famously said, who is this great douchebag? Uh, yeah, the, the worst, the worst. Uh, he said, you control the food, you control the people, you control the uh, means of production as far as tractors and whatever seeds and, and food distribution. Mm -hmm. And especially with, uh, what we call conventional, uh, processed foods and stuff like that. Um, and then all of a sudden the shelves are empty in Venezuela and the media is desperately trying to blame it on him. And so mm -hmm. there's two sides to every story. Always. You sometimes know? three. Yeah. I'm finding that human rights is, is a word that the United States uses as a club to beat over countries mm -hmm. over the head with to say, mm -hmm. he's a dictator. We're going to get him. Yeah. Um, but then the Saudis execute, they behead 81 people in, in one day and we don't even make an official statement. Yeah. 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 This is the great, wonderful world of hypocrisy that I, you get to learn as you get older and you read enough, you know, that, Hey, this is all American imperialism is a mm -hmm. real bad thing. And we yep. might be, we might be the Nazis this time. We're, yeah. We're looking seriously. at the bad guys. Um, so now you've, you've written so many books, so many great, as, and I really have to say uh, thank your, you. your time in the CIA and your whole life. I think you as a storyteller and a writer, you're just unbelievably talented. Oh, thank you. Talented. You know, I, I'll tell you a, a, a kind of a funny story about that. My first book, I, I wrote the first 60 pages and I gave it to my wife and I said, give it a read and tell me what you think. And um, she reads it and she comes back and she says, I, I hate it. <laughs> I said, really? She said, it's terrible. It reads like a, like a government report. And uh, then she said, listen, I've, I've heard you tell these stories a thousand times. Just write them the way you tell them. And it was that advice yeah. that made me just completely change my writing style. And so now that's, that's how I try to write. I try to write it as though I'm sitting you know, across the table from you and I'm telling you a story. Yeah. And it's, and it's your attention to detail and the flow and the excitement in your voice, which, you, you know. You're fa Thank fantastic, you. man. Really. I and, appreciate it. And what's that. great is, and I, I would say it myself, because I you may not know much about me, but I've I used to hitchhike and hop trains and live the homeless Bohemian lifestyle across America for about 10 years. Awesome. And, and that also in itself <laughs> gave me exciting experiences to tell a story by through, you know, what I learned and the wisdom behind that. And you have the same thing. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And, and that brings me to my next question, because um, you wrote a book called Doing Time Like a Spy, How the CIA Taught Me to Survive and Thrive in Prison. OK. And yes, uh, indeed. it's a cool, cool title. And uh, I wanted to ask you, what does an average day for an incarcerated whistleblower stuck in prison? What are some of the best and worst things about your prison stint? The worst things are, are twofold. Uh, one is the monotony. It, it really is Groundhog Day. Every single day is just like every other day. You don't even know what day it is from one to the next. Um, the other one is the, the other bad part is the guards. Um, it, it, Dr. Peter Moskos of uh, the John Jay College um, School of um, Criminal Justice said that uh, the Bureau of Prisons is little more than 
an employment agency for otherwise unemployable, uneducated white men. Uh, and I found that to be exactly true. There's a reason why our prisons are all out in the boondocks, because there's no other industry out there. And, you know, people who flunk out of the local police academy or get thrown out of the military have to work somewhere and they can't all deliver pizzas. So they become prison guards. And I'm not saying that to be mean. That's I mean, most of them actually were pizza delivery guys before they became prison guards. Um, and because they've got authority over people, uh, they, they can be cruel, like irrationally cruel. Um, so that was the other bad part. The normal day, to tell you the truth, and, and this is what you need to do as soon as you get into prison, is come up with a routine. If you can come up with a routine um, and regiment your day, you're going to be fine. So, uh, you know, everybody's got to work, right? It's, it's like slavery. You have to work. Mm. And I made, I think I made like 16 cents an hour, something like that. 14 cents an hour. I don't even remember anymore. And, um, and I would get vast amounts of mail. I would get 60, 70, 80 letters a day from people. And I decided on my very first day, that if somebody was going to take time out of their day to write me an old fashioned letter, I was going to write back. And I ended up responding to more than 7,000 letters uh, nice. while I was there. Nice job, John. I answered every single one of them. So that would be a good part of my day. And then I would, um, I would otherwise uh, write. I actually wrote an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times while I was incarcerated. I wrote an op-ed for the, um, the Guardian. I wrote an article for the Los Angeles Review of Books. So I was getting published by like major outlets while I was in prison. And I was writing them longhand on a legal pad and, uh, and send them to these newspapers and they would publish them. <laughs> so I realized I had an audience and um, I had access to the media. Jake Tapper came up to prison to interview me. Um, I gave an interview from prison to NPR uh, the Greek media. Wow. They used to come all the time. I was in the Greek papers all the time. And so I, I realized I had, you know, I had an audience out there that was interested in what I had to say. So I started writing this book and, you know, it's, it's kind of a serious book and it's kind of a comedic book. Mm -hmm. Um, I talk about the 20 life lessons that I learned at the CIA that I used in prison to keep myself safe and at the top of the social heap. And, um, and it worked out. I ended up winning as crazy as it sounds. I won two literary awards for that book. I won the, cool. the Penn first amendment award, which is yeah. huge. It's one of the big four with the Pulitzer, the Penn Faulkner and the Edgar Allan Poe. And I won the forward reviews memoir of the year for 2016. Just crazy, but it worked out nicely. I mean, you're you're not you're natural born. That's the thing. And then the story's good, and and the book the book is good. And I really recommend anybody out there who likes to read go get Thank this you. book. Go get this book. It's good. It's really doing good. time like a spy. It's called yeah. How the CIA taught me to survive and thrive in prison. <laughs> and this is just one of many books this guy has written, and they're all that exciting. Seriously. <laughs> um, so when you you got out of prison and you began working on this book. Um, what obligations did you have at, as far as secrecy and stuff like that to the CIA and the parole board? What, what could you say? What could yeah. You, it's tricky, right? Good question. Uh, well, there, there is no federal parole board. They, they, uh, they disbanded it in 1986, um, okay. because there's no federal parole anymore. But for the rest of my life, I, I have to send everything I write to the CIA's publications review board. And, um, they didn't object to that book, but they've objected to much of the other stuff that I've written. And I've had to go to the mat with them a couple of times. Um, and uh, one of the most recent books that I wrote um, is, is called um, uh, The CIA Insider's Guide to Surveillance and Surveillance Detection. Right, right. And they, they blacked out like an entire page. And so I appealed and they said, you can't say this stuff. It's, uh, it's classified properly and currently classified is the terminology. 
And I said, you know, I got this stuff off of your website. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) So rather than approving it for publication, they took it off their website. So now as the book is published, it's got a page near the end of the book that's just completely blacked out. So there's a thing on the internet, everybody. It's called the Wayback Machine. And you can visit (laughs) stamped points of time in the internet. Go to the CIA. Go see what was being said about, what, five, ten? Go five years back and see what you can find. Uh, Yeah. Don't let them find anything. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, another another thing is I decided that if the CIA is going to going to, you know, beat on me for the last 15 years and try to ruin my life, I'm going to try to make some money off of it. Yeah, I do. And so I wrote um, uh, the the uh, what was my first book called? It was. Uh, my Secret Life in the CIA's War on Terror, the 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 reluctant spy, my secret life in the in the CIA's War on Terror. Yeah, yeah. Then I did. Doing Time Like a Spy, How the CIA Taught Me to Survive and Thrive in Prison. Then I did The Convenient Terrorist, Abu Zubaydah, and The Weird Wonderland of America's Secret Wars. Then I did The CIA Insider's Guide to the Iran Crisis, uh-huh. The CIA Insider's Guide to Disappearing and Living Off the Grid, I like The that CIA one. Insider's Guide to Lying and Lie Detection, mm. and The CIA Insider's Guide to Surveillance and Surveillance Detection. Yeah. Yeah. So how much, how many redactions overall? And are they friendly to you when you go and visit them or are, do they get you the eye? Uh, they pretend to be friendly. Oh, like yeah. we've never exchanged harsh words, but then they testified against me in the grand jury. Yeah. That's like police <laughs> so, or FBI or anybody else. They're not your friends, but they really pretend like they are. Oh, well, they pretend like you are. Listen, I, I, something happened to me a few, a few years ago that, that, you know, I, that I want to tell you about because I think every American should be aware that this is how um, how our government agencies act. Uh, I was out of prison for uh, two years, and one night around seven o'clock, my doorbell rang, and my youngest son, who was little, little at the time, he was, I guess, four. He ran to the door before I could get up, and he answered it, and I heard this sugary sweet voice say, hi, is your daddy home? And I thought, oh, you bastards. So I go up to the door and I'm, it's not my nature to be rude or hostile, but I was hostile. And I said, may I help you? And this guy says, hi, Mr. Kiriaku. Uh, I'm, I'm Special Agent uh, Smith from the FBI. And this is my colleague, Special Agent Jones. I said, you guys have balls coming here. You know, I'm represented by counsel. And he says, oh, uh, no, no, Mr. Kiriaku, we're not here about your case. Uh, we're here on another matter we were hoping you could help us out with. And I said, what? And he says, well, we know that when you were at, at Loretto, you were friends with Peter the Rabbit Calabrese. I said, so? Well, um, you know, uh, Pete got out. He went home. I said, good for Pete. Well, Mr. Kiriaku, we have reason to believe that Pete has taken over leadership of the Banano crime family. And I said, and you want me to rat out a five families boss? I said, get off my property. And I slammed the door and I called my lawyer. And then he called me back about 20 minutes later and he said, they're not going to bother you again. And they haven't. They basically just said, we want to get you fucking murdered. How do you, how does it sound? Well, and they did something else to me. You know, it's funny. Just a day or two before I left for prison, my lawyer pulled me aside and he said, listen, I need to give you some advice and you need to follow it. He said, DOJ is very upset that your sentence is as short as it is. Very upset. And they're going to try to set you up inside. So he said, don't make any friends. Right. And don't do anything that brings attention to yourself. So I said, okay. I didn't really know what he was talking about, but I said, okay. So I'm there. Let me think. I'm there about eight or nine weeks. And a guy that lives in my housing unit, he nice guy, born in Afghanistan, but but moved here as an infant. So um, you know, he spoke like an like an American. But he was a, a pharmacist who had an oxy problem. So he found himself incarcerated. Yeah. Yeah. 
So he comes up to me and he says, hey, John, there's a new guy here and he wants to meet you. He used to be the spokesman for the Taliban. And I said, not interested, (laughs) not interested. And he said, oh, okay, I'll tell him. So I heard from a couple of other people that this guy wanted to meet me. And I told everybody, I have no interest in meeting this guy. I don't want to speak to him. So one day I'm out on the, on the yard walking around the track and this like obviously Afghan looking guy with a beard halfway down to his waist starts walking towards me with his hand out, like to shake my hand. Just as he puts his hand out, I happen to look past him and I see a guy in the woods on the outside of the fence with a camera with a long range lens. And it's pointed at me. So I put my hands up and I said to the guy, don't fucking touch me. And he's got his hand out for me to shake. And I said, don't fucking touch me. And he said, oh, come on, man, don't be like that. And I said, get the fuck out of here. I don't have anything to say to you. And he says, you and I have a lot in common. I said, you and I have nothing in common. I used to try to kill people like you. And then I walked away. So... Later on, I did a Freedom of Information Act request on myself because they're so stupid at the Bureau of Prisons. Like I say, it's just a collection of rejects from society that work there. Um, And sure enough, they were trying to set me up. And that was just one of many, not many, but several things that they did to get you because on, they wanted to add time onto my sentence. So they were trying to get you on film, shaking hands with somebody from the Taliban to show that you were somehow, Oh, look at him. He's a terrorist. Yeah. I'm a, tra- I'm a traitor. Right. Uh, and the Taliban is, this is an extremist religious nut bar group from the middle East. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how many, uh, I, I want to stick to the questions I got, but I have so many personal questions I want to ask you. Well, I have you back, you know. Um, sure. We got 15 minutes before it's uh, your time. So um, so we're going through a lot of turbulent times in human history with the war, yeah. you know, climate change, the dying democracy at the hand of corporate interest with, you know, the various tactics yeah. they're using to confuse us all and a, right. world, and a worldwide rise in fascism as we speak. Uh, and then on, to, on top of it all, a nice, creamy global pandemic. So <laughs> wh- how did we get here, in your opinion, and where do you think we're going, John Kiriakou? I think that, it, well, from a, from a CIA perspective, um, I, I am not hopeful in any way. I think that the most important um, issues that the American people face are being ignored by government, and I mean especially climate change. In, in, in 1993, when Al Gore became vice president, he ordered that the CIA create something called um, a National Environmental Center to address climate change as an intelligence problem. Mm. And as soon as George W. Bush uh, was elected, uh, he disbanded that center and it's never reappeared at the CIA. But can you imagine the the things like population transfers or food instability that are on the horizon because of climate change? These are all very important intelligence uh, challenges and they're being ignored. Um, I, I have to agree with you, too, about how, you know, we we claim to be this shining beacon of hope for democracy and human rights and civil rights and civil liberties. And it's just simply not true. It's just not true. Plain and simple. You can't be a beacon of hope for human rights when you have secret prisons and torture chambers and illegal renditions. It's just not possible. Yeah. It's, it's hypocritical. Yeah. All the way back to the banana republics. All the way back to the banana republics, which, which we, you know, financed and armed and supported and, and carried on. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not optimistic about, about our future. I'm really not. And I have to say what I, and especially I've just been, cause I'm in Germany right now and I've been reading uh, up what's going on in the UK and uh, they passed a law in 2022. I had no idea that it's limited what people could say in the streets as far as protests. They're cr- giving more money to police cracking down and then saying, we're going to frack and we're going to, drill every piece of oil out of the UK and um, 
Yes. It's a little frightening. That's it awesome. sure is. And the Extinction Rebellion, which is this great group who is trying their best to raise awareness yes. about climate change, um, which is appeals to every rational, intelligent human being that the idea of biodiversity makes sense. It's important. Yeah. Um, they were they were called a terrorist group, and they had to go to court in order to get that that title Ridiculous. retracted. Um, I, I I spoke at their um, their big event in uh, I think it was in November. December last year in Berlin. They're a terrific group. There's nothing terrorist about them. Quite nice young people. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. So, okay. Well, it's good to know that I'm not alone in my kind of apathetic, like, here I am drinking as much wine as I can and like, just <laughs> living my best life now. John Kiriakou approves. <laughs> good. Um, so I got one more question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, that was the uh, that was the last question. So I'll I'll just ask you, um, w what are some of the main topics that are on your mind at this moment? What are you covering on your radio show, and uh, how can we help your your cause? Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm on Facebook, John Kiriakou, K I R I A K O U. I'm on Twitter at John Kiriakou. Um, my radio show is called Political Misfits. It's at um, SputnikNews.com. You go to the bottom of the page and the link is there. Or we're on Rumble. It's, it's both audio and video on Rumble. Um, you know, I'm concerned about probably the same things that you're concerned about. I, I'm deeply concerned about, about human rights and democratic processes, which I believe are, are under great threat. And it doesn't matter who's in the White House. The Democrats are no better than the Republicans. You know, it's funny to me, when, I, I challenged my best friend from high school the other day. <laughs> he and I talk all the time, and he's a total Trump Republican. And he, he said something about um, the Democrats' radical agenda. And I said, Gary, I, I got to ask you, what's radical about it? And he just looked at me. And I said, seriously, though, what's, what's radical? You keep calling it the radical agenda. And, and that's a pretty strong word. What is it that's radical? And then he says, well, you know, like the whole Green New Deal thing. And I said, that, that doesn't even make any sense. But w what is it that's radical about the Green New Deal? And he goes, I don't fucking know. And I said, you watch Fox News too much. <laughs> There's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, except on the fringes. They're yep. both right of center parties. One's just farther right than the other. Both are radical. Both are corporate. Both are, Both are corporate. I said, man, with all due respect, I said, you wouldn't know a radical if he walked up and introduced himself. Yeah. And I like so that. I'm, I'm you, concerned. You were up on Tucker Carlson and you were just like, this is my position. I don't necessarily agree with you, but I'm just here to try to like talk about if somebody will give you yes. a fucking pardon. <laughs> yes. And you know what? I've struck up a friendship with Tucker. He and I disagree on 99% of all issues. Mm -hmm, sure. But he is a, a lovely guy. He, yeah. he gave me his he gave me his cell phone number after my second or third time on the show. We went out for beers. He's a lovely guy. Yeah. He's nutty on some issues. Sure. He's nutty on a lot of issues. Sure. But you know, when it comes to whistleblowing and transparency, he's yeah. up there with the best of them. I love it because sometimes it's a political spectrum. You get right and left, and then you start coming around to libertarian and like right. anti far and then you you meet. Somewhere in the middle. Right? That's like, right. The, we the both hate ideological the government. spectrum is is not a straight line. It's a circle, yeah. and it meets at some point. I'm glad that I'm not the only one that sees it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we're gonna let you go. I mean, we're gonna have you back. I'm gonna bother you now. I got your email. You got a friend for life here. I'll <laughs> always support you in what you do. So let's wave goodbye to all these folks out in TV land. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody. Thanks for having John Kiriako on the show.